right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to open the select board meeting of April 4th, 2024. Uh, and we don't have any executive session tonight. So we're gonna uh, start with open session at 6.30. And <clears throat> I'd like to ask the Assistant Town Administrator to read the agenda, please. Good evening. So after I read the agenda, the select board can vote to amend or approve the agenda. I have not had any requests for public comment for tonight. Items may be taken out of order and topics not anticipated 48 hours in advance may be added. Item number one is a request for permission to use the surplus equipment fund. Chief Zach Ward will be here for that. Item number two is a consideration of appointment to the Sherman Police Department. Chief Thomas Galvin will introduce Isaac Jan Clark. Item number three is an update on the municipal energy aggregation. Michael Lesser, Tom Trainer, and Fred Cunningham will be here to make that presentation. Item number four is consideration of holding the Dover Sherman Youth Baseball and Softball Parade. Bud Guthrie, head of the local league for Dover Sherman Baseball. I think Jeannie will probably be here to, um, to report on that. Item number five is consideration of lowering the quorum for the 2024 annual town meeting and Jackie Morris town clerk and Mary Wolf, the town moderator will be here to speak on that item. Item number six is the consideration of board of registrar appointments. Nancy Hess returned to expire for 125 to fill a vacancy and Judith Schindel Rothschild returned to expire for 1 2027. Item number seven is consideration of ballot questions for the 2024 annual town election. Jeremy Marset will speak on that. Item number eight is the discussion of forming a permanent building committee and Jeremy Marset will be here to speak on that. Item number nine is a consent agenda, which is the TA payroll warrant, draft minutes of March 7th and March 16th, consideration of a one day liquor license for April 4th and consideration of a one day liquor license for April 28th, and then consideration of a building department appointed appointment, Stephen Frasca, assistant plumbing and gas inspector. Item number eight is consideration of a reserve fund transfer acquisition of parcel ID map one, block one, lot zero, so called Gazzani parcel. Jeremy Mustet will be here to speak on that. And item 11 is the consideration of routine business, which is select board reports and the town administrator reports. Excellent. Thank you, Diane. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as read? I'm assuming no revisions. No moved. So moved. All right. That's Sorry. Take a roll call vote. I'll make one of you a second. Uh, make Stephen the second, Diane. Uh, okay. Eric, the motion. Stephen, the second. Uh, roll call, Eric. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Paul, you're voting already on approving the agenda. Aye. And Marion. Aye. Excellent. Are there any changes to the agenda? We didn't no. have any. Do you have any that you wanted to make? No, no. I'm just. I just came late, so I didn't. Yeah, I just no, want to know what I was voting on. <laughs> you didn't miss anything, and we didn't have any funds to accept yet, but um, we're good there. The only thing we're going to do is that we want to do the quorum right at seven. It's on our agenda, but uh, Jackie had to post it separately. So we're going to juggle the agenda around. There's several short items, but we're going to um, do the quorum decision right at seven since that's what Jackie posted. Hey, Jeff, can I make a note on agenda item 10? Um, Number 10, yep. Yeah. It, that involves the city of Framingham, so we put it near the end of the agenda. Yes. Yep. Uh, Understood. And I think did uh, on that one, uh, Dan will probably have to see when they're meeting too to uh, have advisory approve it. Also. All right, that makes sense. I like that. All right, so uh, go ahead, Jackie. Sorry, I just wanted to say it doesn't have to start exactly at seven. Um, for the quorum, it just needs to be after seven o'clock or after. After seven. All right. So okay. then we'll do it in order. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. That sounds good. So the first item is uh, uh, Zach, you're up about the surplus equipment fund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before you tonight, to request permission to expend um, some of our surplus equipment fund money. Uh, it's for two matching funds for two different grants. Um, one was a $12,500 grant we received for uh, ballistic uh, protective equipment. Uh, we actually already have the equipment and it's, it's in service. And the other request is for uh, $5,000. That's the to offset the cost of a fit testing machine that we're also buying through a grant program. 
Uh, so we're requesting to spend a total of $6,624. We have almost 21,000 currently sitting in the account. Excellent. Um, that's and just so the, get a brief summary of what we're looking for. It works that way that they would basically match it's it's purchased with half our funds and half their the grant funds. Is that how you? It depends on the grant. But what happened is these two items just uh, happen to be more than what the grant would cover. So the grant max at twelve thousand five hundred. Oh, the okay. The machine's about seventeen thousand. Yeah, um, I see. So we needed uh, to come up with the other portion. All right, two excellent. Questions. Go Good ahead, question. Paul. Uh, question number one: Don't we need to accept the grant? Also, you already did. We already did. Yeah. Okay. And second question is, what does DFS mean? Department of Fire Services. Okay. Great. Yep. Well, can I make a motion to authorize Please. this? Please do, Paul. More discussion. No, I don't think it, it had, no hands raised. Go ahead, Paul. All right. So I move to approve the request from the fire chief to use six thousand. $624 from the surplus equipment fund to cover the matching costs associated with two grants received by the Sherburne Fire Department. All right. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Roll call, Eric. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Paul. Aye. Marion. Aye. I am I as well. That's terrific. Thank you. Zach, now you can go to your training tonight, right? Exactly. <laughs> Seven o'clock. So thank you. I know. So um, next up, Tom, and uh, uh, another new hire, it looks yes, like. Excellent. We're, uh, we're working, uh, and this will uh, actually finally bring us up to full strength for the department. So it's exciting. Um, so tonight I'm asking to, uh, and, uh, the board to appoint Isaac Gannick um, of Marblehead as our next full-time police officer uh, to fill a vacancy that was created by the resignation of the officer, Michael Um Isaac grew up in Marblehead and graduated from Marblehead High School in 2017. Um, in high school, Isaac played football, baseball, and wrestled. Uh, he was a peer mentor and volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. Um, after high school, he attended North Shore Community College, earning an associate degree. Uh, then he earned a bachelor in science from Salem State University. Uh, while attending college, he worked as a fitness course supervisor at the Jewish Community Center of the North Shore. Um, he's currently enrolled in a master's degree program at Merrimack College and uh, enrolled in the Merrimack College Police Academy and will graduate on April 12th. Um, one little interesting side note about Isaac, he is a car enthusiast um, and he actually collects die cast uh, models of cars. And I ah. was kind of amazed to learn that he has over 12,000 cars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Isaac is with us here tonight. Uh, uh, I see him, yes, that's pretty amazing. Well, well uh... Before you, I let you introduce yourself, Isaac. They're having a, a we're, it's our Sherburne's 350th anniversary this year, and they're sponsoring a car show in May. So you might want to might want to get a, a a trailer up there and bring down a couple thousand to show. <laughs> all, kidding, all kidding aside, uh, uh, you know, Abby Fisk has coordinated it, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something we can work on. Uh, if he'll start, he'll start field training uh, relatively soon, and. Uh... Yeah, sure he'll be around during the day when Abby's around. And we can, uh, yep. we can figure something out. Yeah, just check with her. All right. So, do you want to introduce yourself, or you can say anything you want, or ask questions, Isaac? Anything you? Uh... Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so, I want to thank the select board and Chief Galvin for this opportunity. Uh, I'm honored to accept this uh, position as a Sherborne police officer, and I want to thank you for entrusting me with this responsibility. And I really look forward to serving our community with dedication and professionalism and i'm just really excited to get started so thank you awesome we're happy, happy to question. have you yeah, yeah so can i do the motion can yes, you ask uh, questions paul uh, yeah eric has a question that. go ahead um when you expect it when do you think that um you'll finish your master's uh so i believe the second week of may is when we have uh graduation well, that's soon okay hmm. i guess uh what is your favorite car in your collection <laughs> I would have to say my BMW uh, E39 model from like 1999. Okay. I love BMWs. Uh, and cool. if you stop someone in that car, would you give them a ticket? <laughs> <laughs> You're going fast enough, absolutely. <laughs> That's all my questions. <laughs> and take a picture with them. Uh, okay, go ahead, Paul. You can make the motion. So I move to appoint Isaac Janak 
as full-time police officer with the Sherburne Police Department. Excellent. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. Roll call. Eric. Aye. Steven. Aye. Paul. Aye. Marion. Aye. I'm I as well. So welcome, Isaac. Thank you very Thanks, much. Tom. Very excited. Thank you very much, and congratulations, Isaac. Thank you. All right. I don't. Uh, is Michael Lester here? I don't see him yet. He's our next agenda item. The concom's having a meeting as well, but they start yeah. seven, I think. They, uh, yeah. they usually start I, at seven fifteen. So, but oh. Tom Trainer is here. Yeah. Tom, what do you think? Do we want to wait for Michael? No, I, I I'm going to be uh, doing the presentation. I I thought Michael was going to join, but I I think uh, we can start. Okay, to uh, share my screen. Absolutely. You get. I have four slides. Get the. Can you hear me? Okay. We hear you perfectly. We all got our little postcards too. Oh, that was going to be the next question. Thank you. Uh, we've been in, in, in front of you a couple times in the last several months about the aggregation plan. So I'm not going to get uh, too much into past details, but what we want to do uh, tonight with four slides is just give you an update to uh, a, a very big uh, publicity and education push we're doing. And that it was required as part of our filing with the DPU three, three and a half years ago. And uh, actually in talking to uh, a lot of my neighbors and friends, I'm realizing a lot of people forget that at a town meeting four years ago, and, and how many of us remember that summer of 2020 and early COVID, uh, the the uh, Warren article to approve a community aggregation uh, program uh, was on that uh, town meeting. So, you know, for many residents, they may have not heard anything uh, since then, although we did some uh, some updates. So I really have two meaty slides that I wanted to uh, let let the select board know and uh, hopefully some additional residents that might be on the line or watch the recording, you know, the many things that we're doing and the reason why. Uh, two main uh, purposes, one outreach to, to make people aware of the program. And then of course, to explain the program through some uh, more detailed education. So I just wanna hit uh, some of these main elements. Uh, Jeff, you just mentioned there, there's two initial mailings, uh, a simple postcard and, and a, a second mailing went out a day or two ago, which is a uh, much more detailed, I think it's a, se a six or seven page uh, document with a uh, return postcard in it. So that should be arriving uh, any day now in the mailboxes. Uh, we're getting uh, great support uh, from our town administrator, Jeremy, and his staff, and they put a nice article on the town news uh, section of the town uh, website and also a, a town Facebook pasting, again, to raise, raise awareness about the uh, project. Uh, we had, uh, through the program, the energy supplier Grid, Grid Wealth uh, published uh, with our consultant uh, some uh, PDF documents. Those are getting posted all over town, uh, public buildings, and also some businesses. Uh, I don't know if anybody uh, picked up their mail today. The uh, latest uh, 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 newspaper uh, uh, edition from the Hometown Weekly. We, we made page one, although under the fold, but we made page one for the <laughs> press release. So that's in there. Uh, we're getting great help from the Council on Aging. We'll be in their newsletter on, on Monday and some future newsletters. I'm also getting some help from some uh, younger residents with kids still in the schools to, to uh, get us into the uh, school newsletters. And then something else we're doing uh, is we're emailing organizations like the uh, Woodhaven Elderly Housing, Leland Farms, and some other organizations where 
uh, they'll help spread the communications. And actually one thing I meant to mention at, at the beginning of this, uh, just about all these elements that I'm showing here were actually in our education plan that actually are, are two former sustainability co coordinators that are, uh, unfortunately are no longer with us, uh, Gino and, and Dorothea, they actually wrote the plan with the Energy Committee three years ago. But, but now a bunch of us are uh, scurrying to uh, implement it. A uh, very important element is two public presentations that we have scheduled in the coming weeks, both at Town Hall, both uh, with a Zoom connection. And th those will be conducted by uh, Marlena Patton from our uh, consultants that you, that the select board have met prior. And so she she's done a lot of these and she recommends a short presentation and allowing most of the hour for uh, resident questions. Uh, so those will be happening. And the most detailed uh, place for customer, excuse me, customers, residents to uh, get information is the, the website uh, is, is really got a lot of information. They're frequently asked questions. I lost track at like 30 or 40 common questions that they've got very, very detailed answers. So with all those elements, uh, do you think we have things covered there? Well, of course the answer is no. There's a couple more that wouldn't fit on that slide. So that I've got a, a third slides for you. Uh, <clears throat> you'll be seeing a large banner at the split in the coming week. There's additional posting at other uh, bulletin boards uh, on town, common locations where people uh, show up at Frosty's and Rose's, the pharmacy, uh, the condos. And uh, there's another uh, news outlet that still, still, still exists over Sherburne Patch. We're on that already. Uh, I've been asked to uh, attend a men's luncheon uh, in a couple weeks that the uh, COA puts on and we'll do a little Q&A session there. Likewise, the, the Council on Aging sit and sip. Uh, I was there yesterday handing out flyers and we'll, we'll show up at more of those. And uh, we've done additional emails to several organizations, not all of them listed here in the past week, including our veterans a agent, our, our four churches in town and, and a couple others. And then finally, we have a annual town meeting uh, in, in a couple of weeks where we hope uh, there's gonna be a good turnout and we'll have the, uh, the Sherborne Power Choice flyers there. Any, that's, a, that's a comprehensive any, list. I'm not a next door person, but you didn't list, mention next, next door. I actually have re reached out to Jeremy on that. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, Mike, we'll. We, Michael Lesser just we'll entered also. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it out on next door as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul, has then, his, Paul has his hand raised. Uh, hang perfect. on a second, Tom. Go ahead, Paul. So I wanted to <clears throat> ask you to do something for the listeners and for the citizens of the town that you probably have done a, a million times. Explain, please the process here that you're automatically opt in but you can opt out how does somebody opt out and how do they know that they've been opt in because okay. sometimes you may not be eligible for an automatic opt in so how so does very, the very, very, very important question and i'm going to use my last slide to answer that oh. uh so Which thank you. the postcard, by the way. <laughs> yep, it is one of the postcards. Yep. Uh, everyone that is currently an Eversource customer, <laughs> everyone that's current, and not everybody is, because some people have other third-party suppliers, but everyone that's an Eversource customer, uh, if they do nothing, they will be automatically assigned uh, to one of the three Sherborne Power Choice options, which is the Sherborne standard. Okay. 
but people will have the choice now or anytime in this 24 month contract, they can uh, change their selection to the highest amount of renewables. And I actually did that myself this afternoon, a couple hours ago to 100% renewable. This says 50%, but it's more like 75% with the, uh, with the basic, or they could go down to the 25% renewable Cherborn basic or they could opt out and by opt out means they they uh, either call the uh, 800 number or go to the website. They can opt out of Sherborne Power Choice completely and stay with Eversource Basic and right now pay more money if they do that. So uh, they, they can uh, uh, do nothing and be in Sherborne standard, or they can make changes, either go up in renewables or down in renewables, or opt out completely and stay with Eversource Basic. And, and they can do that, whatever's easiest, by going to a website or calling our consultants at this uh, 855 number. Paul, does that, does that answer your question? Beautiful, thank you. Good. So that's uh, a, that, that's Diane the last has a question. Yeah. I think Tom, hang on a second. Yep, good. Hi, Go yes. Um, Tom, am I right when I say that someone like myself, who already is in a contract supply with a supplier for a contract, will not automatically be thrown into the to the mix of this? Correct. Uh, th that's an excellent question. Uh, you, you 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 will have a choice, but you won't get that mailing, and that's why we're doing so much of this uh, right okay. uh, reaching out because there are you know a fair number of residents that have gone for uh, third party uh, plans. Uh, you should take a look at that plan. Some of them have cancellation fees, and and some do not. And there's a lot of details uh, about that on the on on the uh, website, the Sherborne Power Choice website. So, if if there's no cancellation fees, you you might take a look at the rates and and decide to uh, opt in to uh, a Sherborne uh, Power Choice plan. Excellent, thank you, uh, Marion. Yeah, first, Tom, this was this is a model for public outreach. I can't imagine any other group that's done it so thoroughly. So uh, congratulations on that. I have one question about this little <laughs> postcard you're showing us right now. Why do you say plus 50 here rather than just being straightforward 75% from a renewable so they can compare to the 100%? And by the way, this would be 25%. Why did you not put those? That other numbers. I, <laughs> I didn't write this. Our consultants did, and they followed the DPU guidelines, which I don't. Uh, I, I, I admit I have a hard, hard time following, but I, I just know right now in Massachusetts, Eversource is required for their basic to provide. It's either 24 or 25 percent, and it goes up every year. And Michael could probably add to this. And 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 uh, with our Sherborne standard, it'll actually be seventy five percent renewable. But Michael, can you uh, help clarify the the numbers? The reason we do the plus is just what Tom actually was saying is that the baseline that uh, is changing over each each few years it's changing so that it was 24%, it'll go to 26% as the minimum required. Mm -hmm. so this is right. But plus, if you put, if you put plus like, on top of that. Oh, I understand how it works. Absolutely. But if you put, you know, uh, about 75% or about 25% for the basic, people would be able to compare. Yes, but right. Partly is what I think is what we're allowed to say. This is a heavily regulated process. Oh, okay. So, and actually, if I can add, 
I know in that second mailer that you might get tomorrow, mm -hmm. in that detailed document, it does it does show 75% and a whole bunch of other numbers that are going to con confuse you, but it does show that. Yeah, I guess it will also point out that you could be even more than that because there's the issue of whether you include some of the quote unquote clean uh, sources of, of electricity, such as which at the state level is considered to be nuclear and large scale so solar, I mean, large scale hydro from Canada in, uh, in the next five years or so. And then things will changing. So that's what makes the whole presentation a little bit more uh, of a, a, a little less clear uh, in some sense because of the way the state is re regulating the uh, process. All right, that sounds good. Stephen uh, Sai has his hand up. Um, yeah, so when <clears throat> when does it actually take effect? Like when do the new rates and everything, is there a date, a start date? I believe it's the end, end of your first full month with uh, the plan is August, I think. Oh, I think in June. I think the June is. Uh, in, I thought June. I'll, I'll have to. Re I'll have to I think it's. I think that. it's June, but I. Yeah, I, I it, it it'll it'll be at these present. Marlena will know the answer. Uh -huh. I apologize. So okay. that's what we that's what we had. Excellent. Thank you for your presentation, Michael. You didn't have any more to add. We're all set. Well, I missed the beginning, so I don't know what to add. But uh, no, he did a good job. I think we handled it pretty well. I know. I assume they did a great job. I just you can. I, I know I you're just, you're juggling con com and the select board. And and if I could just uh, thank again uh, Jeremy and Diane and uh, Jeannie for all the help and uh, other members of our uh, committee, particularly uh, Fred Cunningham and uh, Andy Lauterbach, who are here. And Mike. Yeah, Andy Andy just joined. Uh, all right, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeannie, are you uh, subbing for Bud tonight? I am subbing for Bud tonight, yes. All right, go for it. Um, it's the same parade they've had for many years. Last year was a big success. Uh, they'll have food <laughs> trucks. Um, they'll have a baseball game. I believe the... Um, <laughs> The fire department, uh, Chief Ward, has offered a fire truck again, and uh, Chief Galvin is on board. So I think they're looking forward to it. Excellent. What's the route? Do they start like the Memorial Day? Do they start DPW Garage? No, they start at the Unitarian Church. Okay. And they walk down um, North Main down to um, Cemetery and yeah. come in that way. Okay. Excellent. Be good. Sounds Hopefully good. Good weather. Better than today. I know. Yep. Tom, did you want to add on to that? Yeah. I just want to say, yeah, Bud reached out to me over a month ago. He was very proactive. We've, uh, you know, exchanged some text messages on this and uh, we'll have no problem handling this. And it, as Jeannie said, it is a, it's a great event. All right. How many, how many ballpark, Jeannie, how many youth are in the, the program? Do you know? There's a lot. I know. I, re I remember. It, it kind of faded for a while, and this group seems to be very involved, very pushing it. Um, I know my son, who said he was never going to get involved and never going to coach, has been right there. So, yeah, <laughs> it'll be good. And does it include girls? Are there softball yeah, leagues? Yep, yeah. the softball league is, is – there's quite a few, actually. Yeah, um, it's just showing my ignorance, but I want everyone to understand the program, so – Okay. Paul has a uh, comment too. No, not a comment. Uh, uh, I was going to make the motion to approve. Great. Is that okay? Uh, yes, go ahead, Paul. Well, to approve the request to hold the Dover Sherber and Baseball Softball Parade on Saturday, <laughs> April 27th at 3.30 p.m. with baseball softball festivities at Jameson one field immediately following the parade. Excellent. Is there a second? Second. All right. Roll call, Eric. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Paul. Aye. Marion. Aye. I am I as well. Thank you. Uh, thank Bud for us too. I will. For thank donating you all. His, his time to it. So.
you're a big baseball family. I remember when Mike was running, was the commissioner or whatever they call it. And we still are. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Jackie, how did we do? We are right at seven on the nose. You are just amazing, all five of you. <laughs> within oh. 10 seconds. You made it within 10 seconds. Exactly. I, was, I, I added those questions about the baseball league to do that. Though. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. I just didn't know when you guys were meeting. And I had I to post the announcement seven days before the meeting. It's required by law. So yep. that's what. So uh, do you want any preamble or should we just, we've done this every year, I think. Right. And so the reason that Mary, Mary can speak also, but the reason that we wanted to bring it forward was because the, the it, it seems as though since the pandemic, the numbers for town meeting have not rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. And we've, you know, barely had over 100 people. And for 2022, we had some votes that were below 100. Yep. So we just thought it would be a good idea to bring it forward. There's only 15 articles um, on the warrant this year. I don't know how many people, we never know how many people are going to show up. So. And just to refresh my memory, you know, we were historically 100, but when COVID, I think we went to 50. Have we been at 50 every year since COVID? Is that no, right? We were 20. 20. 20. And last 20. year you were at 50. Okay. Uh, all right. Excellent. Um, anything else you want to say, Eric's, uh, got his yeah, hand just, up. Well, yeah, just a quick question then. Um, I guess, I, uh, so the establishment of hundred that's in the bylaws, correct? correct. Okay. So take, take a change of bylaws and your opinion, is it ever worth you think doing a permanent change or just maybe do this until and feel that I'll keep doing the vote of the select board and, and see how it goes. I'm just curious, just your opinion, I'm not looking for anything hard and fast here. Okay. The. The law is only good through right now through March 31st, 2025. So unless Governor Healy extends it, this will be the last year you'll be able to lower the quorum. I happened to mention to Jeremy the other day that I wish that we had put it as a warrant article to permanently lower the quorum um, for this town meeting, but um, it just went over, you know, I forgot, I didn't even think okay. about it. So maybe next year we should put it on the warren if you guys are interested. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we don't need to lower it that much, but um, I do think it should be lowered. I don't know. That was my next, that was my next Mary, question. Yeah, may I ask Mary um, her opinion. Like if you were to permanently lower it, we think like 75, something in that range, or 50 you go to, to seven, 50 to 75. The, the, one of the things is now that we're doing the electronic voting, people always know how many votes are being cast. I know, I know. So, you know, I mean, it, the electronic voting is great, but as it gets toward the end of the night, if somebody for a particular, you know, agenda that somebody might have at some meeting for whatever reason yeah. does a quorum call, then we don't have to put people there. We're sunk. I yeah, I th do I'm think of the reserve fund transfer with paying for pizza at the end of the meeting might just be our only, only out. I, I do think that the attendance of tell me is critical. And I think there have, yeah. have been some questionable votes, frankly, over the years based on low numbers and stuff like that. I won't go into details about it. And I think it's essential. I would be willing to engage in some kind of like ideas on to how to increase it. There's, there are two things that I've heard of in other communities. One is they made the quorum like 10 and then everyone wound up showing up and things yeah. like that because they didn't want 10 people to make a decision. That was kind of an interesting psychology experiment. The other one is actually they do a, a random drawing on when the articles go up. Mm -hmm. Like the fact mm -hmm. we do the citizens petition at the end every year, I don't know why that is and everyone leaves because it's just the least engaging to be honest with you, the citizen petition. It's just, it's just yeah. the way it is. You put like anything school related at the end or disperse them throughout or something like that or have random draws. There's one town that actually does, they, they just literally, they, they don't do them in order. They actually have a random draw when it comes up and therefore people have to hang out for the whole thing or, or whatever. You know, I just think there has to be a um, kind of a thoughtful, you know, maybe I don't want to say study because I'm not looking to beat this up, but just a, a look at some other communities and get an idea of what it'll take to actually like just increase it to town meetings. I think there's just not an appreciation of how important it is. Yeah, that's because I don't like having 20 people decide what the other 4,200 are going to do. And that's why more people show up. There's a town that made it real low and yeah, they yeah. always exceeded 100 after that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't remember who was first. Uh, Stephen, were you you want to go first? Um, yeah, I guess my question is just um, for last year's town meeting, do you have the like 
high and low numbers for attendees uh, or I guess number of votes? Like what, what was the yes. range of actual? Yes. So we had 135 people, 135 voters check in. The first article was um, 104 to 7, so 111 votes. The last article or last articles were 84 to 31. So um, they, ra they range. I mean, people, people were coming and going. Um, it's in 2022, it was a lot more, um, uh, the, the differences were, were, were much more. Um, we had some votes that were, were under a hundred, um, in 2022. Okay. But last year we never dipped below a hundred. Uh, no, we did not. We got close. 112, I think was the lowest, uh, 80, uh, 100 and yeah, 112. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah. I remember with the select board and advisory and the moderator and the town clerk were right <laughs> at 20 without anybody else showing up. So uh, uh, Paul and then Mary. So I raised my hand because uh, one of the towns where I'm town council, we dropped the number to zero, no quorum requirement at all, oh. which means two or three people could decide a $150 million budget without any issue that produced a 450 attendance 450 uh, uh, and ever since people make an effort to go just so that the fear that just a few people will be deciding all these issues would would actually uh, happen so that was a an experiment that demonstrated that quorum requirements actually inhibit attendance because people figure I don't need to go because there's always going to be the right number. Yeah. So that, that was point number one. Point number two, from a legal perspective, you're screwing ourselves, shooting ourselves in the foot with a quorum requirement because legally you have to have the right number and anybody mm -hmm. can challenge it at any time. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the number, you have to adjourn. So there's a fair amount of expense that is involved in calling a town meeting, mm -hmm. having people attend. That is uh, people checking in. I mean, there's, there's paid staff. There's all kinds of things that goes on. Mm -hmm. That's all wasted if you can't get a quorum. And I've, I've sat through many town meetings that never were able to convene because mm -hmm. they weren't able to get to the, the quorum to sufficient to even start. So all of that suggests that these quorum requirements really don't accomplish what the proponents want it to do. It doesn't really assure adequate representation by the town and it can cripple a town. It can prevent you from meeting deadlines, can prevent you from getting any work done for any one of a, a variety of reasons. You may be stuck with out votes being taken that need to be taken. So I'm last year I was in favor of continuing the 20 that we've had for now three or four years. But I think the majority went with 50. You want a little more than 20. Uh, but I'm, I'm still at 20. 20 seems perfectly fine for me because that's perfectly safe. I think we'll always have 20. When you just count the advisory, you count the select board, the moderator. Yeah, we're right at 20, the ballpark. Right. So you can you can keep the business of the town getting done. Yeah. And it, then it's really up to the public. If they <laughs> want to have uh, uh, 20 people deciding these things, that's a choice they make. If they don't want to come, they are in essence saying they trust us all, the, tw the 20, to do what's right. Okay, that's a good point. Ballpark, what's the population of the town that reduced it to zero and got 450? 23,000. Yeah, okay, so it's five times our size, four to five times. Was it a representative town meeting? Usually over 10,000 no. representatives. No, it's open <laughs> town meeting. Open town meeting for twenty three thousand. Yeah, and they were getting very. They were getting 
Sherburn was doing better. Let's put it that way. Hmm. And they well, were. Okay. I just want to get a perspective of what 450 was. So it was, you know, that would be like us getting 100 relative to the population of the town. Hmm. Ballpark. Uh, I think Mary had her hand up next. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that if you're looking for some uh, research, I have um, a database that includes what the quorum numbers are for most of the a lot of the towns in Massachusetts um, through the Mo Mass Moderators Association. So I can I can get that information and I can put a question out on the gavel line about you know participation and what experiences people have had as well, if you like. If you, you know, this would be not for this year, but you know, for, yeah. for if you if you want to go forward. One thing you might do is if you can sort it, uh, any towns that are either zero or no quorum. Yeah. Would be interesting to know. Yeah, it's a, it's in a spreadsheet, so I can yeah. sort it however I like. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, the how many towns are that way, and you know that it seems like that's would be an interesting data point. Yeah. All right. I uh, let's see, Paul, your hand is up again or no? No. We'll take All right, down. Eric. I think is next. No, I'm Your just going to make. I'm going to make a motion. So I don't know if Diane wants let's, to speak. Let's see what Marion Marion had something to say, and then we'll take a motion. Uh, no, I had a I had a comment that uh, it's a comment that's valid whether no matter what we decide. So I'm going to take my hand down and let's make a decision. Okay, but then you want to uh, make the comment before we vote? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I could make a comment quickly. Yeah, the, my comment is is just that. Um, my impression is that almost no one in town outside of this this group, this room, I was going to say, uh, is is aware of the quorum. I mean, most yeah. people are not. So I was surprised that lowering to zero made a difference among the general public. Who cares? I mean, who knows? Uh, yeah. unless, unless we did an out, outreach analogous to the power choice yeah yeah I'm well they also sure don't know that the town meeting is being held either but yes <laughs> <laughs> so uh all right eric you can make your motion i move you lower the quorum to 10. Ooh. okay any any discussion i'll second it all right um i don't know i, I I probably wouldn't go that low myself, but we can try it, I guess. What what are the what do you want? I'd be to... I'd be curious what Mary and Jackie think about that. Yeah. Um, um I just be careful because the uh, Jackie probably has the law <laughs> right there, but I think it can only be lowered to a certain percentage. Maybe 10 is okay, but maybe not. Going to our it... materials, it's okay. 10 is the lowest. 10 is the lowest, okay. I wouldn't lower it quite as 10. That still, that makes me nervous. I don't know why. <laughs> I prefer it a little. You're going to meet in a phone booth, I know. Uh, we'll be all set. Let's post it. I would actually encourage the clerk's office to post it, to post it on next door. Say a bump. Honestly, I, I, I don't want to call this a social experiment. It's too important to experiment with, but um, it's one of the things I'm in agreement with, Paul. I've actually heard of this situation before, and... Um, you know, at some point, uh, and I, so I'm very serious. So I would like to engage some kind of effort to increase our attendance as a town meeting. And there's a few ideas out there. I okay. don't think people realize how important it is and how much of their day-to-day -day lives. Can no, I, just... I would be curious to know, Mary, I don't know if you have the ability to, you know, ask, uh, you know, the moderators association, have there ever been scenarios where a quorum was lowered and then they found that the attendance also dropped in parallel with lowering the quorum or if that's just not something that happens i i can ask i i doubt that that happens you know i i really do i i think it's if it if it has any effect at all i think it's probably more like what paul said but um it, it, interestingly we got very high we our our attendance seems to track controversy so when there's a special town meeting that usually mm -hmm. indicates controversy, we usually get a big turnout. If there's, uh, you know, even a regular town meeting, we get 500 people the year of the turf fields. Exactly. You know, so you know, whatever that means, you know. Uh, and then, my, and then my, they all left. 
later in that exact meeting, I, it went down to right. 100. It's, it's, it's like 70. I remember that right. so well because there was something I felt wouldn't have passed if they had a, if they the had a COA, large, the COA, that's the they year. voted down yep. right after that. That's yeah. right. That was the year. I remember that so well. And that's yeah, yeah. Thing, if that was a random pick and they were all texting each other saying, show up now, do whatever. Yep. Yes. I remember that so well. And that, and that was also the, I believe that was also the year of the, um, the Labarsky property, the, um, with the, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was, with, when they I were, think that yeah. was the same year. I can't swear to it, but I think it was. I think that's correct. Yeah. All right. So, um, did you want to add some, well, uh, I, yeah. go ahead, Paul. A couple of comments. Uh, <clears throat> To the notion of uh, a lottery system for articles, a couple of towns that I represent have that. It really doesn't work at the end of the day. It doesn't work because to the extent that you have to have presenters, you have to have experts to, to let, let's say we decide to build a new school, to, to yeah. use an extreme example, that's like a $200 million thing the proponents don't know even what night they don't yeah. know what hour and they're yeah. paying people the engineers they're paying people to answer questions to be there in case any questions come up yeah they don't know when to be there yeah. and and secondly you have to get your appropriations done mm -hmm. so if you have a lottery system and the core and it, you have everything in the lottery system well you may lose your quorum before you've done what you really have to do at town meeting, yeah, which yeah. is appropriate the annual budget. And, and if, so if you lose your quorum and you have no budget for the next year, you've got to call another town meeting. You've got to go through all this stuff. Whereas most citizen articles, if you lose your quorum for, for the citizen articles at the end, you still have accomplished fundamentally what you have to get done at town meeting, the whole purpose of the annual town meeting is to do the appropriations. Yeah. So that's why those are always first. And that's why the citizen articles come afterwards because everybody needs to make sure that while they have a quorum, they get what has to be done. Yeah. And that probably messes around with the, the lottery system with the consent agenda too, because often you bundle things together too. Yes, yep. So uh, Jackie. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to make a comment about trying to do more outreach. And um, I, I think that um, a comment that Paul had made maybe last year was that people are actually sending their vote in by not showing up. I mean, we do put a banner up at the split. I have a huge banner that, that goes up. The advisory report goes to everyone it is amazing how many advisory reports Jeannie and I go to the post office to pick up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, you know, we, we post on next door, we put stuff in the newspaper, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think that we do advertise that town meeting and it's the same Thursday every single year. Mm -hmm. so, my comment on outreach had nothing to do with that. My comment on outreach okay. was lowering to 10, but outreach that's lower to 10. Okay, <laughs> Okay. Then people get concerned. Okay. I have no problem with the average of town meeting. Let people know it's only 10. That's a select okay. board that, that the person next to us specifically. So I put a vote of the 10 and people see it and then people show up. Okay. Got All it. right. Well, we'll have a scientific experiment. I, I, I'm more with Mary and I don't think people have a clue what the quorum is. <laughs> but uh, so we haven't voted. It might just be Paul and I voting for it. It might be. Who knows? Well, might be well, uh, I, think, I think I don't see any more raised hands. So uh, you made a motion and Paul seconded. So why don't we do a roll call vote? Is that all right? Any, any other comment? Just, just one more comment. OK, go ahead. To, to what Eric was just saying, <clears throat> you'd be surprised. I mean, when I was president of the Massachusetts Selectmen's Association, there's 1,100 selectmen. A lot of them got elected without ever having attended a town meeting. Hmm. Completely out of, out of left field. They hmm. get elected because they're popular or they've done other things hmm. uh, that the community respects. So there are many people who are in charge of town meeting, of calling town meeting, doing warrants, who have never actually been to a town meeting. That's how well known it is. 
Yeah, and if they had been, they probably wouldn't run. <laughs> it might be a good thing. <laughs> that doesn't happen in Sherburn. We yeah, like. I know, I know. <laughs> once. All right, you guys. I think we beat this. Do you have anything more to say, Marion? You're okay with the vote? No, no. The, the motion is for ten. Just yes. Motion is for ten. Motion is uh, ten. So roll call. It was seconded uh, by Paul. So Eric. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Paul. Aye. Marion. A reluctant aye, but it's an experiment. That's how I feel too. Aye, as well. Five to zero, Diane. Thank you, everyone, for uh, providing us with, um, you know, deliberation and better understanding of the consequences. So we'll find out, I guess. Can we, Thank before you. we leave this, put a, a, a note in the file for next <laughs> year to do an article to adjust the quorum permanently? Yep. yep. Rather than rely on the statute. Or if there's a fall, it might be good for a fall. Yeah, because the, when did you say it expires and when in 2025? <laughs> Right now, it's March 31st, 2025, but that doesn't mean that it won't get extended. Yeah, um, but I mean, if they didn't extend it, we couldn't you have could, it. You we could have it be an article, but we would have to have 100 for next April. Correct. Yeah. You need 100 to vote it down to whatever. Yeah. All yeah. right. So if you have a special town meeting, please <laughs> have mercy on me. Um, <laughs> don't do it. Do it. Don't Just be careful of the dates. That's all. All right. We'll try. The presidential election coming up. Lance All right. Uh, the next is uh, two appointments to the board of registrars. Uh, Diane, we have Nancy Hess, and uh, I'm not sure if Judith Rothschild is here. Is she here? I don't see her. She's not here. Yeah. She's Nancy Hess has for a one. Here. Nancy Hess for a one-year term to fill a vacancy. Okay. To expire on April first, twenty twenty-five. And, and, then, Judith, and Judith uh, Rothschild is a three-year term to expire for one 2027. So we're supposed to, this is the question, we're supposed to ask the chairs of the, the town committees to produce candidates. Did, did that process? Yeah, so, yeah, so every year, uh, so I send out a letter on behalf of the select board. Last year, I got no, um, comments from anyone. I did speak to Michael Goldstein, who is chair of the Democratic Town Committee, because I am short registrars. I've got petitions and nomination papers that need to come in. And um, Michael is, has told me he approves and to do whatever. He's always told me do whatever I need to do. And I will be sending out another letter. But I have vacancies because Michael Kickham passed away and Ed McGuire had to had um, had to drop off the board. So um, I'm short people. So I I really need these appointments to go through. And Michael, um, they're both um, Democrats and Michael has given given his blessing. Great. So can I make the motion? Please do, Paul. All right. Sorry. Uh, hang on one second, Paul. Mary has her hand up. Yeah, oh. I just, I just actually had a, a quick question, not about this specific. Well, not this situation, but do you have to be enrolled in a party to be a registrar, or can you be unenrolled? No, the only person that can be unenrolled is me. Okay. So it it is required to have um, one person, at least one person from each um, political party, Democrat and Republican, and like I said, the only person I am a I am a board of registrar um, as town clerk. I am automatically on the board, and town clerks are the only ones that are allowed to be unenrolled. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. I think uh, Paul. So I move to appoint <clears throat> Nancy Hess to the board of registrars for a one-year term, expiring April 1, 2025, and to appoint. Judith Rothschild to the Board of Registrars for a three-year term expiring April 1, 2027. Excellent. You have a second? Second. All right. Roll call, Eric. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Paul. Aye. Marion. Aye. I am I as well. Excellent. Uh, you're up, Jeremy. Um, ballot questions. 
Sure. Um, this is coming back to you from your last meeting. Yep. Um, the ballot questions are due to the town clerk, Jackie, um, to uh, to get on the ballot for the town election. Um, there are eight items uh, that were discussed at your last meeting, all for debt excluded uh, debt exclusions for capital projects. There was a question on, I believe, number seven, um, and whether that was to, was going, going to be withdrawn from the the project champion. Um, the Recreation Commission has has chosen to keep the the request as presented. That's the Jamison three field uh, hundred thousand dollar one, right? Correct. Yep. So uh, for your uh, consideration tonight are the the eight uh, items uh, for the ballot. Well, I'm, I move to place on the ballot questions one through eight. Okay. In the end all right before we uh vote we're uh, well, i know you like to move things but can't make sure the discussion's ended and yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. La the last one i waited let moran talk before i made the motion yeah yeah it's okay it's go ahead we're, we'll we'll discuss it now all right you can um, discuss it after a motion is made it's actually better practice to make a motion and then have discussion rather no. than have discussion and then a motion well i know but we've done it ahead. both ways whatever, but i just think i yeah. Okay, so um number seven. So as far as the Jameson Field, so if it doesn't pass town meeting, then it's moot on on the ballot. Correct. Let's right. make sure people know. Yeah. Okay, not there. Um, was there a was there a change? I think capital budget met last night. Is that correct? Did they vote on Jameson Field? Dan could tell us. Capital budget had previously voted to approve uh, the Jameson Field project, so that is, they did vote affirmatively. Uh, they did not change that vote last night. Uh, however, last night they did re-vote some of the items that uh, were different from their previous votes uh, to be consistent with what was approved or uh, or heard at the advisory hearing. <coughs> All of the capital budget um, uh, items in their, their uh, dollar amount that were approved at uh, the advisory hearing have also been uh, re-approved, if you will, with the same values from the, by the capital budget committee. Okay. Do you have any more questions, Eric? No, very good. Marion, let's just see. Dan took his uh, camera on, so maybe he has a point relevant to this question. I don't have anything to add beyond what Jeremy said. That 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 I think laid it all out. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Marion. Yeah, my question is uh, something <laughs> I raised last time, uh, last meeting. I think we discussed all of these. Um, when people get the ballot will they see the amounts that are being requested? Because if not, yeah. how can they feel in, feel informed enough to vote on them? Yeah, you asked that last time, and, but you, we we can't do that because um, you, you want to explain that again, Paul? Why, why the- no, I, I understand that you can't on the ballot, but yeah. is there some sort of informational guide that can be distributed to the town? Um, beyond just what's the uh, the the town meeting warrant that would give people some guidance as to what they're what they're asking for well, jackie uh talked about that last time too go ahead jackie yeah i said last time that i could make something up i just um i can have it available like in the lobby i just cannot have it inside the polling place yeah yeah, yeah. there is a statute that has local acceptance that requires the town council to prepare a summary of ballot questions and that gets mailed to every voters <clears throat> every voter in the town we have not adopted that statute so other than that <clears throat> there isn't a formal process for educating people and the reason why the amounts aren't here is because the amounts are unknown so there may be at town meeting, there may be an estimate that a project's gonna cost $100,000. But when you go out to bid, that interest rates are not determined until the bidding is done. And the bond premium, the cost associated with the bond, all gets added to the price. So what might be a $100,000 project mm -hmm. might be $200,000 that the taxpayers are actually gonna pay. And because there isn't that amount, the legislature felt that it was misleading to put a, an amount in there because it's all subject to this, this other procedures that have to be done, competitive bidding on the 
the bond and all that stuff. Did that answer your question, Marion? Uh, no. Uh, well, I mean, Jackie's going to put, you know, one thing we could just put copies of the warrant booklet out. If you get all those ones that you have to pick up at the post office already anyway, that nobody. Uh, all in the advisory report. So yeah. that those additional copies could be placed outside of the polling. Just on the lobby downstairs That's next right. to the yeah. COVID I, I mean, I, I, I could just do up a one page thing of saying this is what was voted at town meeting. Yeah. Um, correspond to each question. I mean, I can do whatever you guys want. I mean, that makes a lot more sense to me than putting out the whole booklet where yeah. people would have to ferret through it to find. Uh, I just think people, even though we don't know the exact amount, as Paul explained, I appreciate that. But at least to give people a ballpark idea of what they're voting on, I think we have to make it easy for them to understand what they're okay. voting on. And All the right. one page thing is a good idea. All right. I think Dan had a comment too. Yeah, I know. Dan, were you okay? Or you want to? I was just, I, I think everybody knows this, but of course the advisory report has all that <laughs> subject yeah. point that Paul made that the numbers might be different, but yeah. every household should have a copy of that, which, you know, again, it's not all on one page. You have to go through it, but it is, it is yeah. all there. But the, the election is, the, the voting is like three weeks later yeah. and people won't have that in their head. So, yeah, yeah. And there was only 10 people at town meeting anyway. So, <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, take us home, Jackie. Anything you want to add? Oh, I, I was just going to say that the, that, you know, the normal turnout for elections is, at least three to seven times what yes. the annual town meeting is exactly so, i mean you know we could get 375 we could get seven i would say 750 is normally but we are going to yeah. have over 600 vote by mail ballots sent out so i'm hoping that that um uh, because of the march primary people filled out you know ballots for all elections so they'll automatically get a vote by mail for the annual town election so hopefully maybe the turnout will be higher than normal i don't know all right well thanks for all your planning help keeping us uh, organized all right next item jeremy is the permanent building committee sure. did we vote on these questions yeah we need to vote oh do we need to vote on yeah i guess we do don't we my yeah. mistake yeah you want to make the motion paul i i did to adopt as as recommended all the, right uh, eight uh questions that we have at my i forget if someone seconded do we have a second second all right roll call eric hi steven hi paul hi marion hi i am i as well all right take two jeremy sorry about that <laughs> no problem uh, thanks jeff um, just bringing forward an idea for your discussion wanted to gauge um, the board's interest in uh, forming a permanent building committee. Um, I believe it has been something the town has discussed in the past. And now that we've got, um, uh, you know, knock on wood, uh, one of the a major construction projects uh, more or less behind us and wrapping up and, and that associated building committee, the library building committee, uh, sort of finishing their work, um, there may be some, uh, you know, it may be good to have some, some overlap with such a permanent building committee to, to kind of glean some of the lessons learned and have some continuity in that experience. Uh, and also looking um, at our capital uh, proposals for the spring and, and upcoming, um, there's certainly some projects that a permanent building committee could be uh, very useful in, in helping uh, move along and, and keep on track. Uh, that being you know, the annual town building capital that we request each year, uh, the display space for the historic um, items in town, uh, there's some items, capital items for the Pine Hill School, uh, including, um, you know, the HVAC uh, improvements and a roof and, and possibly some other improvements as well. Uh, in fact, earlier this week, um, uh, we met with uh, Dan and myself met with Superintendent McCoy, Don, uh, the business manager and their uh, architectural consultant to, to get a uh, preliminary draft 
uh, presentation on the facilities assessment that they've conducted for the Pine Hill Elementary School, uh, which I think a permanent building committee made up of, of residents, volunteers that are experts in the field would be, um, I think, very helpful in, in helping such uh, facilities assessments uh, with, with the way they go forward um, and vetting their, their, um, you know, the content. Um, so just for some discussion purposes, I included samples from four other communities. There's many more. You go to Google search it. Many communities our size and larger have permanent building committees. Uh, I included samples from Medfield, Norton, Harvard, and Millis. Uh, in the case of Medfield, that started as a select board advisory committee for, and that went on for several years. And then it became a committee uh, established by town bylaw. Um, and just to give a bit of a summary on what uh, a permanent building committee might do. I'm just going to read a little bit from Norton's uh, website. Uh, it just provides a pretty good description of, of a permanent building committee. Uh, it, say, it states the purpose of a building of a permanent building committee is to have a continuing responsibility for the execution of major construction and maintenance projects for the town and for the development of a capital spending plan. Working with a select board, school committee, historical commission, planning board, and other town committees and boards that propose building and renovation projects, the permanent building committee shall establish general criteria for town building projects and guidelines for communication regarding these projects between and among interested communities and the public. Um, so uh, just with that, I just wanted to gauge the interest of the board um, and whether you wanted um, to sort of the task, Sean and I, to, to help um, you know, carry this idea forward. Well, I have a few comments, but I think I'll go last. I think Paul raised his hand first, I think. Well, I just wanted to give some some history here. Um, and and Jeremy's kind of mentioned it already, but I'll kind of elaborate on it. When, when I first became a select board member, virtually every town building was in need of major work. And the list was daunting. It was not done for my time because basically uh, there wasn't the money when you added up all the projects to do everything that needed to be done. And as part of the discussion of you know how are we going to do this, what are we going to do, there was a discussion about a permanent building committee. A number of towns that I represent have permanent building committees. I work with them. They're they're very good at what they do. But to some extent, the time for Sherburn to do this is past because we decided this there simply weren't the volunteers who are willing to come forward and do this on a on a permanent basis. Rather they were people who were willing to come forward, but they wanted to work on particular projects that they were interested in. So we had we had to do things like uh, Woodhaven. We had the police station that needed to be built. We had the DPW garage that needed to be done. The schools needed to be done. Town hall had to be rebuilt. The fire station had to be rebuilt. And we found it easier like for example, for Woodhaven, to have people who were involved with Woodhaven and had an interest there to, to be on a committee to do things at Woodhaven. And the, the same thing with, with all of these, the school projects. It, it was easier to find people who were involved with the schools or ha had kids that were gonna be affected by it. So, Establishing a, a, a building committee after all of the big projects have been done, I think is, isn't going to work. It, 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 it didn't seem to work before when we floated the idea. And as I say, the, the solution that we came up with was these ad hoc committees. We have a, a problem getting volunteers as it is. Not all our boards and committees are fully staffed. I bet you if we did a list of vacancies, we would find that there are openings. 
And to get qualified people like engineers and, and people with construction experience to, to, to attend regular meetings and have to keep minutes and to comply with the open meeting law and to post meetings and to deal with a roof repair. Um, I think you're gonna have a very hard time finding volunteers to do this. It, it, it may be easier in big towns. Um, the, all the towns that I know have building committees are bigger than Sherburne. And they have, they're behind us in, in, in many ways in, in renovating all our buildings, but we have basically done all our major buildings have been renovated. Does more work need to be done? Always. We have the insight report and says you know, there's this things that still need to be done, but I have my doubts about the wisdom now of doing a building, a permanent building committee. That's, that's just the historic perspective. All right, thank you, Paul. Stephen? Um, yeah, I, personally, I think it is a good idea. Um, I think seeing what the library building committee has done. Um, and so right now the region, do they have their own school building committee? I don't know. No, they don't. Um, okay. So, so if, if Pine, the Pine Hill project basically, uh, you know, wh whenever that happens, mm -hmm. it would be essentially this, this building committee that we're establishing that would be, overseeing that it wouldn't be a regional school building committee. Okay. Um, I guess one question would be, uh, generally speaking, these building committees, are they primarily advisory committees or do they have like executive authority as well? Like what, how, how much, how much actual, well, like, the, the library building can... committee, uh, approves invoices, for example, because usually you want things approved at the lowest level where the information is well known so that select board can't approve a, a, an invoice for the architect because we don't know if they did the work or not and even the library trustees so on. so one thing that the um you delegate the authority to the people with the most information and so the building committee approves things that probably a higher level committee wouldn't have the either the detailed knowledge or the first-hand experience to, to decide on something like that so they review every invoice for the library, for example, and looks at how many hours were required to elevate or re work, whatever it was. And they, so they, I don't know if you consider that executive authority, but they're, they're the right. decision making body. They're making those, decisions. And is, is that here. how permanent building committees generally work in other towns where they exist? I don't, I don't know that. Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. So typically the building committees I work with, they do the procurement, they do the contracts, they uh, monitor the contracts, they yep. uh, do not only the, 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 the main construction contract, but they do the designer contracts, they do the subcontractors, they do, they do they're pretty much involved in everything. And with the chief procurement officer and with town council, because we're constantly writing contracts for them. Yep. To, review so it's not like they're they're doing it all by themselves but they make the decisions on, on a general basis because they're bylaw committees and as part of the bylaws th those powers are given to them if you're creating an, ad an advisory committee to the select board which is something you might want to experiment with set up this committee see if we can staff it see how it works uh then they they are simply an advisory board to the select board so we end up signing the contracts we end up approving awarding bids um, approving the, the invoices and so on and so on so if we were to if we were to do that to make it an advisory committee to the select board are we able to simply just do that in a meeting yes yes okay and then, and Jeremy, you said that that's how the committee sort of began in Medfield, right? Um, so, yeah, correct. 
I guess to me that would be an interesting way to go about it um, is to essentially we can establish it. We can see if we can um, populate the committee and then see how basically see how this interaction goes and then and then decide if we wanted to make it a permanent you know committee by by bylaw. Yeah, yeah, I have some different ideas here too that I'd like to get on the floor, but Eric's first. So I'm 50 50 on this. Um, on some things like I, 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 what is it? I agree with Paul, although I don't agree. I do think you'd create a committee, but probably would get some good response and some talent on it. I worry about maintaining the energy long term. If it's, you know, one thing when it's for a project, like um, the library bill committee has some great talent on it, really great talent. And I think they signed up for a three-year commitment, not seven or eight or whatever, whatever it ended up being. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> and I worry about this maintaining that long-term energy and something like that. Because I appreciate that you want the lessons learned. You want a, a group made of people who are policymakers who yeah. basically will say like, okay, here's what we learned from the library. And here's what we learned from this and da-da-da. We'll do the next one better because this is the mistakes we learned on that one. There's something there. But I worry about getting that long-term energy in under no condition. I think I'm with Stephen this one if I'm reading him right. And in no condition, I think a committee is going to be like approving invoices and telling people where to go, and whatever. You know, we established a uh, director of facilities. We have better um, professional paid staff than we've ever had. You know what I mean? Um, between a town administrator and John and anything else, I, I, there's no way I'm going to endorse having a group of uh, volunteer citizens taking that micromanaging level and taking things down to such a level. It should be policymakers and advisory and, and stuff like that. That's the only way I would support something along these lines. But I do worry about that long-term energy. I mean, you look at like, um, we just saw the uh, ener energy aggregation and it was awesome. It was done by a group of volunteers largely, I think, you know, that struggled with some um, professional support and did a great job. Um, but, you know, they've been in it for a few years. What's this going to look like 10 years down the road? So th those are some of my hesitations in this. And, um, and you know, we talk about the form of, of, ten, uh, of 10. I worry, um, what do you call it? It still winds up being, I, I, used, I throw around numbers. I think it was maybe 20 or 30 people actually run this town as an entirety, you know, because we have such overlap in different committees and stuff like that. Um, if that's the case, that's the case. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm just talking both sides right now. I'm not sure where I stand in this. The only thing I can say for absolute, there's no way I'll support a committee that actually makes micromanagement decisions and does, you know, the, the detailed work and does a lot of that stuff there. That's all I'll say. All right. You want to go first, Sean, or you want me to go? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine either way. You want to go ahead? Well, Eric just said most of what I was going to say. And I yeah. just wanted to reiterate on the, um, you know, in the knowledge base that we lose when we burn out a committee and then we, we, we re regroup. There's tons of professionals. We can always stack a committee full of incredible, incredible professionals. Um, but they're all green on kind of the Sherburn knowledge. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's infrastructure that spans through all the buildings and and including the school. And and mm -hmm. the school should never, I, I think, be allowed to work on their own without any involvement from the town. So this committee or some other fashion should, should at least have a hand in, in it. Yep. I concur with that. So here's my idea. The word I object to more than anything is the word committee, because that then implies that you're meeting regularly, you're producing minutes. What I would consider doing, like if you think of the library project, Richard Littlefield is a world-class scheduling person. I mean, world-class scheduling person. We have people that are just, you know, Mark Brown, people that are phenomenal. I would envision it being I don't even really like the word advisory, being an cons internal consulting firm in Sherbourne of pools of expertise. And so they would each have a bio, like maybe a one paragraph bio, what their functional expertise is, because each project may or may not need, you know, a, a detailed scheduling person, but there some might. And so if you had that uh, sort of consulting group of residents who've committed to dedicate some time to the town they could maybe give 20 hours to the school project and five hours to some other project on their particular functional discipline but they don't all need to go on the whole journey they could just be uh, put in place when their particular expertise was required so you have this sort of you know i'm, I'm envisioning it could be like 30 people but 
any one project might only have three or four, but we know that, you know, John Hyde or all these different people have certain disciplines and Sean and Jeremy probably know way better than I do. So they would know which three or four they might need for a given project, but they wouldn't need to sit through all 10 projects that we're working on. They would just be sort of a spot resource, if you will. So that's, I'm not, I'm not describing it in words very well, but I think that's gives you more flexibility than having 10 people do every, every project. The, uh, so, uh, I, Marianne, I think your hand was first. I can't, I can't remember if you were Paul. Actually, actually Paul was first, but okay. he's already spoken and I haven't, so I'll go. Good. Okay, Paul. <laughs> Absolutely. Go right no, ahead. Go for it, Marianne. <laughs> right. I kind of, I kind of feel like uh, I've just been listening to this and these are all really good perspectives. Um, I feel like uh, a elements of what everyone has said uh, could come together and work. I think we need to talk a lot more about this, but <clears throat> I certainly can see the value of a group of people that is that are uh, committed to keep the sort of institutional um, knowledge, the, the, the knowledge base alive. So you're not starting from scratch every time. Uh, I agree, you don't want them micromanaging. And I also think that the consultant pool that Jeff suggested is also a good idea. Uh, this group could draw on that pool. Um, when particular projects come up, <clears throat> you'll also want to recruit a uh, few people, maybe from the group, maybe not, whose heart and soul are into the project. So I think there's kind of a hybrid form that that might work. And um, I'd, I'd like to think more about it. I think overall, it's a good idea. I mean, talk about burnout of committees. All of our committees, you know, suffer that danger. And yet, it seems because people like being involved, they like working together, uh, the committees go on and on in Sherburn. And, you know, there's always someone new who's willing to step up when someone leaves. So um, I think there's a good um, hybrid solution here. I don't know exactly what it is, but. Yeah. I also idea. would encourage it. I wouldn't have it report to the select board. I would have it report to the town administrator <laughs> jointly with Sean rather than the select board. I don't yeah, think- Yeah, I'd agree with that too. I don't think we need to be involved because this is more of an implementation role, I think, than a strategy role as I look at it. But uh, Paul. Three, three points quick. One is literally, if you're going to have a permanent committee, you need a town meeting vote. We don't have a town meeting. At least it's too late for this annual town meeting. There may yep. be- special in the fall, but essentially you're looking at next year. So there's no reason for us to make a decision now mm -hmm. on this. This is something that we can discuss at least until like December and then see whether we want to put an article on the warrant if we really want to do a permanent committee. The second point was that the thing that Jeff described of consultants, a pool of consultants, that's something that the Board of Selectmen creates or the town administrator creates. So A, it doesn't need a town meeting vote. It just means keeping a, a roster of names right. and, and knowing who to call on different things. So the town administrator needs to be involved because of the chief procurement functions. Mm -hmm. The select board may need to be involved because they may want to give some dignity to the group by a name or some organization or, or, or staffing from the select board office and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, and then the third point is that uh, this, this idea about, gee, this group is gonna have a, a school project to deal with. My experience with other towns is that schools like to do their own building committees and like to be in charge of their own buildings. And there is a region here too. So if there was a region project 
and Sherburn had this building committee, you're going to have issues about what building committee would have what role mm -hmm. in connection with a project where there's another community involved and so on and so on. So oftentimes you see two building committees, a school building committee dealing with, with school projects. If the school system is big enough, they got a lot of buildings, they got a lot of projects and a municipal <laughs> building committee. Mm -hmm. And to get them to talk and work together is, it's like putting uh, uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis together in a room to try and get them to agree on, on things. Uh, this is just general experience from other communities. Things may be different in Sherburne, but uh, don't right. count on the schools welcoming a, a town building. Well, we, I mean, Frank Hess was on. I, I don't know whether Pine Hill actually had a building committee or just a capital committee. I can't remember. Frank was on it, I know that, uh, many years ago. Uh, because they also, it's not really a building project if they're replacing air handling units or something like that. So I think they had a capital committee of some sort, but I could be wrong. Uh, Marion. Uh, yeah, just a little addendum to the consultant pool idea, which I, I really do like. I would also add to that though, that there is a big value to the collegiality of groups that work together in this town. So rather than have them a bunch of free agents that never hear from the town at all, or may or may not hear from the town, it would be worth um, creating some sort of uh, sense of, of groupness in that group. I mean, just to make it more interesting for them, you know, <laughs> otherwise, why should they do it? So anyway, that's for- We don't want to burn them out and we do have a hard time recruiting people. That's the other okay. issue. And by the way, Paul, that list of vacancies is on the website all the time. Diane updates it all the time. So we don't have to make the list, we have it. All right, so uh, we're in violent agreement. What What do you think, Jeremy? Should we maybe- yeah, this, this was a great discussion. I it. Yeah, Thank I'm glad you, you proposed it. Um, you and you know, I think there is some some timeliness with with some uh, providing some continuity from the winding down of the LBC, and I think you know there sh there could be some uh, value in having um, some sort of group. Maybe it's a uh, to support the town administrator and Sean type, type group um, for for building projects and building maintenance. So, uh, but anyway, lots of great ideas here, um, and we'll uh, we'll think about them, and uh, we'll come back with at a, at a later date. So. Again, nothing, yeah. no, no request for action tonight, but just wanted to get a sense of the board. It's a good uh, idea. And I, I, I'm thinking the roundabout would be a large project. And I think Sean knows this, I think, but I think it's Richard also very knowledgeable about highway construction, I think, too. Isn't he, Littlefield? He is. We used to work together in a transportation firm. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's pretty valuable. All right, everybody. Sounds good. Paul, you're good at consent agenda motions. Move approval. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor, Eric. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Paul. Mm -hmm. Just one qualification to the motion. Yep. The, yep. The minutes were were changed. Diane sent around a thing saying she updated the yep. minutes. So the motion is not for the minutes that were in the packet, but for the minutes that Diane subsequently issued. Yep. Yep. All right. Hi. So, uh, and Marion. Yeah, yeah, I think Aye. we already did the roll call vote. Marianne? Aye. And I am I as well. All right. Now, I think Eric's going to, are you going to recuse yourself now? Yeah, I'm going to step out. So, thank you very much. And everyone have a good evening. All right. You too. Thank Go you, Jeremy the, and Diane, for making this last. Turn the Bruins on. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the next thing, um, do you want to, who's describing this, Jeremy? Are you? Yeah, um, this, this is a, a project that um, the Land Acquisition Committee has been active in. Uh, there's a parcel, the so-called Zany parcel, and, the, and the, the northwest corner of Sherburne near the town lines of Framingham and Ashland. Um, it's about 1.2 acres in size. Uh, and as part of a, a grant that the city of Framingham uh, received from the MVP program, uh, they will be purchasing uh, 11 acres 
in Framingham, 27.4 acres in Ashland, and the so-called Zanny parcel, parcel in Sherburn. Uh, Framingham would purchase them on behalf of the other two communities. They would become part of, you know, they would become town of Sherburn or Zanny. The Zanny parcel would become a town of Sherburn owned. Um, but as a as a part of that, there is a uh, a, a matching matching portion to that MVP grant. And there's some costs to prepare the closing documents by way of some land survey. So yep. there is a, a land trust um, account that we have. There is some question on the accounting and, and the authority to, to use those funds. Um, but the in the interim, before we were figuring that, that out, but it, it's still taking some more time. Um, in the interim, we're, we're proposing that uh, our reserve fund transfer be um, be approved to fund the, the three thousand dollars in the uh, grant acquisition costs and the two thousand dollars towards the survey, uh, so that um, we can participate in this program with the city of Framingham uh, and move forward with this acquisition. Um, Excellent. Does anyone on the? You can probably stop sharing now. Does anyone on the select board uh, have questions or two two questions? Sure, go ahead, Paul. First is every time any one of my towns propose acquiring anything, I ask, what's the uh, 21E status of the property? Is it clean? Or are we going to have millions of dollars cleaning it up? That's part of the due diligence that the city of Framingham will be doing. So we don't know the answer to that yet. No, and you know, as you know, the, the proximity of this site, um, it abuts some existing town uh, of Sherburn property to the south. It abuts uh, a property owned by the uh, by Eversource, and it abuts the CSX rail line. Uh, but it is fairly it's contiguous with some other town owned property, um, and would essentially be combined with with that open space and be protected. The other question was, uh, have you consulted with the land acquisition committee? Yes. And are they in favor? They are. Then, so let me know, Jeff, when you want a motion. Okay, well, let's let's see what Marion has to say. Yeah, I have a question for you, uh, Jeremy. Uh, this this the the kind of hand drawn map you showed uh, has this little triangle that we're that uh, we're purchasing in within another larger parcel uh what is that large should i should pull up the the map that i need to understand how does that triangle fit in and how does it connect to the conservation lands exactly is it surrounded by con yeah thanks yeah. is it surrounded right. by conservation um it is to the south this this parcel to the south underneath the yellow triangle is owned by the town of sherburn uh the parcel across the rail right of way, the strip that runs down through the center here is the, the railroad right of way. Mm -hmm. right. On the side of the railroad right of way is the rural land foundation properties. Um, farther okay. south below the town of Sherburn properties, another town of Sherburn property. Um, there is a power line uh, that runs through this area. So there is ever source property just to the north whoops, uh, and to the on the opposite side. And there's some additional uh, Sherburn properties. Uh, in Framingham, the, the 11 acres in Framingham is a, a, essentially uh, abutting the town line in Sherburn, and same in and the 27 acres in, in Ashland that would all be purchased um, as part of this. So, you know, in, in entirety, it's it's over, it's close to 40 acres that would be purchased um, mm -hmm. and protected as a part of this this program. Right, so it's not just an isolated little triangle of protection in an otherwise private land. Um, and it, does that have anything to do with the uh, the former uh, route of the Bay Circuit Trail across the railroad tracks and into Ashland? There are a series of, of trails. I think there's like a, mm -hmm. a levee trail um, and some other trails in Ashland uh, that may be part of the Bay Circuit Trail. Um, yeah. Right, because I think that was the part of the, well, the railroad crossing is the problem there with the Bay Circuit, but yeah. if 
if <laughs> when uh, that railroad land uh, was no longer railroad uh, and was the extension of um, the the rail trail, uh, this would be a base circuit link from the rail trail over. So yeah, it's a no brainer. I was just curious. It actually shows a body of water there too, of some kind of vernal pool or some kind of yeah. There's a it's a body beetle. there that's you know to the to the west of the bulk of the triangles. <laughs> yeah, pretty it's, small. It's a big beaver pond. Yeah, there is a dike right in that triangle, I think, with the trail that goes across it. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, see, probably don't need to share anymore, uh, uh, Jeremy and Stephen. Your hands up. Uh, yeah, this is a simple question, but um, how much do we have in the reserve fund right now? I don't remember having done any transfers, it's so I'm not, assuming it was the full three hundred thousand is left okay. in the reserve. Yeah. So it would be a five thousand dollar reserve fund transfer. Um, none of it has been touched at this point. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't know, I think they need it now because I didn't know if we have turnbacks, but since we haven't used any in the 300, it doesn't really matter, sort of. And uh, Rob, did you want to, you had your hand up a minute ago. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention that was, I think that was a little bit misleading what was said about the Bay Circuit Trail. This parcel does have, I think, a trail crossing it north to south, but um, the where the old Bay Circuit Trail ran across is actually a bit south of here. But it's it's really part of the whole deal. The um, two of the big wet properties in Ashland are have what's called the Dyke Trail on them, and that's the middle third of the trail that runs all the way from the rail line over to 126 as part of the old Bay Circuit. So um, the the western third is already protected by Ashland. They have an easement. It's it's on private land, but they have an easement. Uh, the eastern third is on rural land foundation land, so that's already protected. And this is a gap in the middle. So um, the other part of this deal, the Ashland properties, will open up, will protect that entire stretch. We still have to get across the rail line, which will hopefully happen at some point in the future. Yeah, Rob, I didn't mean to mislead. It was really more of a question about the Bay Circuit Trail, but I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Mr. Trainer. If if you uh, wanted, if you had the time, it'll take me 10 seconds. I can show you a uh, another map look that shows the trails in that area. Excellent. I'll bring it up right now. Can you see that? We can. Yeah, that's that's the uh, triangle right there. I think, Jeremy. Yes, thanks, Tom. Yep. And and this is uh, the North South Trail that Rob just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. This is the the trails that that I got from SGIS. So huh. Connects to a side side. I've never been on those trails, but. Huh. And then the bit the base circuit, Rob would know, is down here somewhere. But I just wanted to show you that. Mm. Interesting. Thank you, Tom. All right. So, do uh, you want to make a motion, Paul, to make a reserve fund transfer? Yes, but I, I want to highlight an issue that uh, to acquire this property properly, we need a vote of town meeting. And so mm. I'm thinking that maybe we should. Uh, call a special town meeting within the annual town meeting. I have to look at the timelines. You have to give 14 days notice of a mm -hmm. town meeting, special town meeting. Uh, a one article uh, special town meeting within the annual town meeting to authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by purchase gift or eminent domain a certain parcel of land described that and then describe the, the uh, parcel. Okay. Because to acquire real estate, you, you're supposed to have a town meeting vote. But passing that, the motion I would make would be to, to approve a, to request a, to endorse a 
uh, reserve fund transfer of $5,000 being 3,000 for matching funds for a grant and 2,000 for acquisition costs in connection with the purchase. Yep. And acquisition of the Zanny parcel. Okay, excellent. So um, before we vote, Sean has his hand up. Oh, he, he said he had made a, a chat suggestion. Would the town, maybe if we don't want to have it in town mini, could just the Rural Land Foundation acquire the land? There's a couple different foundations that could acquire it without a town meeting vote, couldn't they? Well, what I'm proposing, if 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 I was the lawyer on this thing, I would make a purchase and sale agreement and go through the closing subject to a town meeting vote. And if town meeting voted no, then I would try to transfer it to one of these other organizations uh, to, to assign the purchase and sale agreement. But what I'm missing is that detail of when do we have to close on the acquisition if we have to close on the acquisition as opposed to providing the funding in like the next two weeks then yeah we're we have to make it all subject to town meeting if we are going to do an ordinary acquisition we can do a purchase and sale agreement with a closing in uh, in april of next year What's the timeline on the acquisition? I don't have the details, Paul, but I believe it was within within this calendar year time frame. Uh, sooner rather than later. So in the in the meantime, I'm sure you can explore other foundations, but the motion is to, to give the five thousand dollars. So that money is there. Uh, yep. And so that you can you can proceed in that direction, but I'm going to amend my own motion to, to add the uh, uh, parenthetical here, which is that uh, this is all subject to uh, town, a town meeting vote to acquire the property. An affirmative uh, favorable action on a, on a town meeting by town meeting to acquire the property well i the only thing that maybe there should be two motions because we, we probably have to do the two thousand was actually for surveying i think we need to expend some of the costs before we make the acquisition you know what i mean good point all right so let's go back to the original yeah. motion yeah just to, let's get the money first so yeah forget the parenthetical the motion is five thousand dollars three thousand for the matching funds two thousand for acquisition costs right is there a second second all right let's do a roll call vote on that uh stephen aye paul aye marion aye and i'm i as well so four to uh uh recuse i guess you'd call uh cyan for eric and so then uh do you want to make a second motion on the town meeting um approval no i need more information so somewhere along the way now that we've uh, uh, we don't have the authority to to actually issue the five thousand dollars that's advisory yes uh, but hopefully on our recommendation they will they will provide the five thousand and as part of that survey all of that there's more details i could tell you how you could do the acquisition this is what i do for a living happy to to help out here and tell you what you need to do, but I, I can't tell you what you need to do right now because I need to know when this thing has to close, what's the timeline. And I, I still wanna see a 21E report to indicate that it's not, there isn't a, a, yeah. a problem on the site. It's gonna cost us millions. Yeah, that's a very important point, but I'm a little less concerned because it's only one acre and it's surrounded by land that's already owned by the town. So we already, the, if it's an environmental issue there, it probably isn't contained within a one acre lot. But people often in the old days used to dump things. I know, I know, I know. And it's right next to railroads were uh, notorious. Yeah, notorious. Yeah. Notorious, yes. As were power lines. 
if they had PCBs in their transformers or something, who knows what? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, all right. So uh, I guess, but but if we that are you saying that we won't be able to have it in town meeting, or should we? Are we going to need to have a special select board meeting next week if you decide that we need to do something at town meeting? But we need a town meeting vote to acquire. Yes. But is it too late it's to a do permanent that? acquisition yeah. that's going to be a, an asset or a burden on future taxpayers yes for a hundred years it needs a town meeting vote uh, but I there guess. was a suggestion that that some other group might want to buy it yeah i think we should buy it because the town of sherburne has the adjoining parcels yes so the way you can do it without calling a town meeting is basically you you put you buy it subject to a town meeting vote and then you hope you can convince the voters in next april or okay. the next town meeting essentially to ratify if yep. they say no then you, you you can't you can't own it you have to get rid of it okay but, but you well, only got it we've already solved that because you only have to convince 10 voters so you're okay <laughs> but, but Paul, <laughs> what what if uh the what if the closing has to occur before the next town meeting? You couldn't close on on the parcel. Well, that's why I I, I want to get the information before I say anything. Yeah, let's because it's a discussion. It, it should it, be an executive session. It may not even be possible to do for this town meeting. So why don't we? Maybe you could do some investigation. This you know, maybe not tomorrow, but next week and. We may need to call an emergency select board session to discuss this further in executive session. It sounds like, if if it's possible. Well, town meetings is the is the twenty third. Correct. You have to give minimum fourteen days. So if you track fourteen from. Yeah, we're at, today's the fourth. Right. Yeah. So you, so, so you, you got have... a couple days, and I, are those business days or calendar days? The fourteen days. Calendar days. Oh, all right. Well, you got maybe one or two days of, of uh, swing space here, but not much. Nine days. Yeah. Right. Monday's the eighth. So that would be, uh, what would that be? 12 and three, it would be 15 days. So you'd have to decide Monday. So I could write the, I'm just thinking I could write the article while you go on to the rest of the agenda, but I, I don't have a property description. Yeah. You, you have a survey done. It's gonna give you survey that. I think would, would make that. I think it's it's still early on in the, in the due diligence because the, the property description will be uh, developed by the, the land survey. Um, but I think what we need is a lot more detail from the city of Framingham as far as the, the timelines and, and everything that's been discussed. So um i have my marching orders all right but if we need to have a a special meeting on monday you just let me know i'm yeah. i'm going to be uh looking at the eclipse on monday from 2 to 4 p.m but other than that i'll be available <laughs> if we were to have a special meeting on monday though we would have to have posted it posted it, it. yeah that's already at this point yeah. so yeah, yeah. I, I don't i think realistically there's no time to get it done yeah for the upcoming town meeting a, i didn't just... even think of that that's a good point Stephen. <laughs> Well, you could post it. You could post it right now, couldn't you? Uh, no. No. no, it's too late. It's, it's too, too late. late. Too late. Well, you can actually go to Monday. Would be uh, fifteen days, so you can actually go till Tuesday. So, I, if it's really fourteen days, I think. But I, I just don't see the point of trying to brush that through right now, especially yeah. given that you know Jeremy is like. There's a lot more due diligence to be done. I mean, I think that, yeah, if it turns out that the timing won't work, then I say you explore if to see if the Rural Land Foundation wants to do it. Um, alternatively, we just wait and see if there's a fall town meeting, and 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 that would be the town meeting. You know. Okay. We'll we'll figure it out. No, yeah. All right. Th thank you, uh, Jeremy. Thank you, Paul, for your uh, guidance. Also. All right, so the only thing left is routine business and we'll start with select board reports. And I listed a couple things, but I think Marion was, you wanna talk about the legislation that we, the letter we got from um, Arena DeRosa's aide, Jeff Myers? All right, uh, Arena DeRosa's aide, Jeffrey Myers, 
uh, sent us a letter assuring us that our revised legislation for the water and sewer district has been filed. It's now new legislation. It's got a new number. Uh, and uh, it is uh, in the Secretary of State's hands at this point. And uh, beyond that, I'm not sure exactly. Maybe, Jeremy, you could tell us what the Secretary of State has to do or not do before it can go on to committees. Uh, do you know? Uh, from my understanding, so what's been filed is House Bill 5024. Um, my understanding is it first goes to the Sec Secretary of State, which has a review because it's creating an, uh, a water enterprise. Um, and there's a required uh, newspaper or publication that we'll need to do within a certain amount of time um, as part of the Secretary of State's review. Um, that's my understanding was at, that's what was the hiccup the last filing that the Secretary of State's office had some requirements that were not relayed back to Representative Arena DeRose's office nor the town of Sherburne. Some of time elapsed and the, the bill needed to be refiled. Right. I'm not sure to what extent this uh, makes it possible or impossible for this bill to be uh, considered in the current legislative session. Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, Arena DeRosa's aide, told us previously in a meeting that small issues like this, small bills that uh, ordinarily the legislature would simply uh, approve, uh, they're non-controversial often pile up at the end of the session. Yep. They're approved all together all at once. But I'm not sure if this will t make it through all the committee hoops to get to that pile at the end of the legislative session. So yep. maybe sure. a little update on the, the other special legislation that, that we filed, the treasure collector, if that helps in the context of, of how things are moving. Um, yeah, sure, go ahead. So that, that actually has gone through, I uh, had a favorable uh, report out from a House committee. Uh, the House had three readings of the bill and have um, engrossed the bill, and it's now with the, the Senate. Um, they've uh, had their first reading and have placed that uh, the uh, their uh, the bill on the orders of the day for their next session. So that, that Paul can probably describe what that all means better than I. Uh, but it seems like the treasure collector special legislation has is moving along fairly quickly. Uh, Jeremy, just believe. to remind us, uh, which special legislation is this? So the combining the treasure collector position. All right. Yeah. So that 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 bill is going to pass within the next week, or or two weeks. The uh, legislature ends formal session on July thirty one by rule, but they have informal sessions thereafter informal sessions work so that anybody who makes an objection prevents the bill from proceeding and also you can't do any roll call votes and you can't you can't do any formal uh proceedings at all uh most of these these home rule petitions can get enacted after July 31, because they're not controversial and nobody objects to them and they and they get done. So it's possible that it'll get passed, but but before it gets passed, it has to go through the Secretary of State's review. Then it has to be assigned to a committee, mm -hmm. both in the House and in the Senate. And then the House has to have a, a hearing on it. And then the House has to decide the committee has to decide what its recommendation is. And then it's got to be scheduled for three readings before it can get enacted. That is going to be a tight timeline. It is, yeah. But, you know, hope springs eternal. I'm, I'm not too optimistic that it'll get through all that, but it's a little bit out of our hands now until it gets into committee where we might have a chance to testify. I don't know. We'll see. Hmm. All right. That sounds good. Um, one other update that I talked to Stephen about, we were, uh, uh, John Smith's the high school uh, principal. And so he's asked 
he sent me a note asking for a speaker for a graduation in June. So Stephen hadn't done it yet. So I arbitrarily uh, asked him <laughs> <laughs> if he wanted to do it. And so he, he needs a, a relief pitcher though if it rains because the the it's a Thursday night. The first week of June is the graduation night, but they they used to move it indoors if it was a rainy night. But that people hated because then you had only two guests you could bring. So if you had you know a, a mother and a father, you couldn't bring their brother. <laughs> so they don't do that anymore. They go to the Friday night is the rain date. So Stephen can't do the rain date. So what I would propose, Stephen, let's wait till then. If you, I'll give them your name if that's okay, or I'll connect you. And then if it on Monday of that week, if it looks like it's going to be rainy at the end of the week, then maybe I'll just be your pinch hitter or something on Friday night. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. We've all done it numerous times. So it's I know, not, a, I know. not a hard job. It's, yeah, yeah. it's a very happy occasion. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Although I remember my funny story about the Mr. Jeffries on the uh, Dover Select Board wanting to know how much we got paid for doing it. <laughs> they, Dover Dover Select Board members get paid by the town to do it. Do they really? They do. Oh, yes. No way. I, really? Like two hundred dollars, I think he told me. He wanted. He, he was mad. He actually, I thought it was. I actually laughed in his face because I thought he was joking. He wasn't joking. He was <laughs> mad that it hadn't been raised to two hundred and fifty dollars. Oh my God. <laughs> God. So, anyway. Uh -oh. Anyway. I, I had no idea. I, I really did think he was joking. So anyway, so uh, I don't have anything else in a select board reports or any, uh, uh, Marion or Stephen, did you have any select board reports for Paul? No, no I assume that Jeremy will tell uh, talk about our MPO grant. In... Yeah, I was going to do the uh, town administrator reports next. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um... Just wanted, yeah, some updates for you all. Um, uh, Marion and Dan Sickle and I had a, had a good time at open, open office hours earlier uh, this week, Tuesday at the COA sit and sip. Uh, next Thursday, we've got two open office hours scheduled, one in the morning uh, from 9 a.m. to noon here at Town Hall with Sean and the Public Works folks. Uh, and then we've added a session uh, where uh, Heidi Doyle and Dave Welch will be joining me. Uh, from 6 to 8 o'clock at the Sherman Public Library uh, next Thursday evening. Um, definitely uh, want to welcome anybody else to, to come and, and, and be with us. Uh, we're going to get the word out. That's a, a new newly added date and time outside of uh, work hours. Hopefully we'll get some folks uh, that will be freed up to come and, and say hello and, and talk about things going on in, in town. <coughs> um, we had uh, the, the ECDC nursery school for kids. I wish I could have taken some pictures, but they have some uh, requirements against that. But yep. it was great. Uh, they toured town hall uh, on Wednesday. And uh, I wanted to thank all the town offices here in, in town hall for all that, for being so welcoming and, and making the point to, to talk about what they did, what they do, and how they help the community. And the kids had a great time. Um, uh, some staffing updates. Uh, We've had interviews with uh, potential Board of Health administrator candidates. Um, uh, Julie, Daryl, and myself, uh, with, with assistance from Diane, uh, have held, held some uh, interviews after receiving a number of resumes and have a promising candidate that we're moving on to the next steps with. Um, similar on uh, the conservation agent, um, uh, Courtney, Michael, and myself, and, and Diane met with uh, and had some interviews with with uh, candidates, and have we also have a a favorable, desirable candidate that we're moving on to the next steps with. So, uh, hopefully, more news to come by your next meeting. Uh, maybe we'll have some good news on those two positions. Uh, some news on the Maple and Washington Street roundabout construction. Uh, we have had some uh, meetings with our contractor Lynch. And they've uh, proposed some more, some dates. And uh, Sean has put together a draft uh, news release that news release that we'll be getting out shortly. But uh, as a heads up, um, they'll be starting work in the area on May sixth. That that won't be affecting traffic. It'll be off outside of the roadway areas. There's some stormwater drainage, erosion controls, uh, and some other things they can do, uh, including the library stairs, which we talked about at your last meeting. That'll all begin on, on May 6th. 
It won't be until June 17th that the roadway and intersection would be closed. Um, and then um, the other milestone would be, you know, by the end of August, uh, the roads will all be open back up to traffic uh, prior to the first day of school. But more, uh, much more detail will be presented in, in a press release soon, but we're just hearing that in the, the last couple of days, so wanted to relay that. You might, well, I'm interrupting you, I know, but you might want to look at the uh, library fair. It might not be ideal to do it the two Sean knows this better than I two or three days before the library fair or whatever the day the library fair is yeah it's, it's the week before so we're I'm going to work with the contractor to make sure we don't completely yeah bomb bombard the fair uh, yeah. so, James we'll wants us to <laughs> or Courtney does We'll do what we can to accommodate that. Courtney's gloating because ConCom meeting is done before us. Oh, <laughs> oh that's good. <laughs> All right, we'll resign and uh, uh, run for ConCom or ask to be appointed. In addition to the press release, Sean is, is going to reach out to all of the nearby project abutters um, to get them details on the project and yeah. they should contact and all that. Um, good. Heads up on Laurel Field irrigation wells. Uh, the aqua freed processes were, were completed, um, and the consultants coming back out next Tuesday to run the pump tests to see if that was those were successful or not. Uh, and so after Tuesday, we'll know if they're viable wells for irrigation. Uh, and um, the big news today, as Marion alluded to, was that the Boston MPO. Uh, voted to include our design pilot in their funding program for federal fiscal year 25. At their next meeting, they'll actually release or uh, release the, the tip, a five-year tip that would include it. So one minor um, step to go, but the, the big vote was in favor of our project uh, this morning. So good news there. Excellent. Good stuff. And that, you should have all got an, an invite. I forgot one thing. You know, the 350th celebration should have sent you all an invite to the movie screening. They're having a pre-screen next Saturday, the 13th. And Jeff, so, you're the star of the show. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> I've talked to my agent. But uh, <laughs> And but Mary, it, you it's, and Mary are the stars it's, of the show. It's 1 p.m. on um, Saturday, and I, I think it's in the library, the lower level of the library. So it's a screening of just for town employees, and, and I'm not sure who all was invited. You know, Diane, who the list was? I'm not sure who. I don't. Uh, I'm so, uh, but I but don't. anyway, it's next Saturday if you at 1 p.m. if you want to see the. Yeah, that's it, right. It's the full. It's the full. It's not just the trailer that we saw before. It's the full movie, but not being made public for a week or two after that. So, and they do, as I said earlier, they're doing a car show. I was talking to Abby Fist, they're doing a car show in May. Mm -hmm. uh, so they got a lot of different things planned. All right. Any any other? Uh, Move to adjourn? <laughs> yeah, I don't see any other hands raised. So yes, do, do, we, have a, do we have a second? Second. All right. Uh, uh, roll call. Steven. Aye. Paul. Aye. Marion. Aye. I am I as well. Thank you, guys. Great meeting. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Diane. Bye, everybody. Ciao, guys.